Ladies and gentlemen, for the ones in attendance and the millions watching around the world, the Big Bad Network presents the High Flying Podcast. Podcast. This is the High Flying Podcast, where we be drop kicking it with the boys, so make sure to body slam that like, share, and subscribe button. I am your host, Biggie Bag Johnny, back with another video, and today we are going over my favorite segment. I did this already, but now I'm going to give you the full one. Uh, hopefully, we got everything going on this. I'm going to watch this literally, guys, for the seventh or eighth time. In the last two days, I'm really trying to get this content out to you guys. I see y'all watching part one. It's unfair to you guys that y'all only got about 17 minutes. So let's get into it, guys. This is my favorite of all time show. This is the dark side of the ring. I'm going to give it to you like I just watched it. Like it's not the eighth time I just brought this to you guys. But fuck it. I got 44 more minutes in me to give to you guys. I've watched this, but let's go. And we're going to act like... We're going to act like we didn't just go to Damn the straight, I'm saying dollar signs if somebody like John Tanner walks through the door. Who's the biggest, baddest son of a bitch on the planet? I John Tanner. all those little bastards. With a superhero, you need a villain that's just as powerful to counter. You needed somebody like my dad. You are going to fail the earthquake. You know it was over because he'd go like this across his throat, jump a couple times around your head. The tremors are beginning. Run to the set of ropes and then just jump on your chest. Kaboom! The earthquake splash, man. Larger than life, John Tenta had a meteoric rise in the WWF as Earthquake before being paired with another big man, Typhoon, and the iconic tag team, The Natural Disasters. It's bad weather for everybody. First of all, I did this wrong. This is the motherfucking dark side of the ring. John Tenta, a.k.a. Earthquake, a.k.a. Shark, a.k.a. Uh, Avalanche. You know what I mean? If you don't know, get your motherfucking facts straight. It's about to get real, real, real. This episode is going to make you want to get your life together, get 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 yourself to the doctor, and call your dad. Let's go, bro. Natural disasters, earthquake, and typhoon. A thousand pounds of fun. There was no picking them guys up, put it that way. You go to lift them and, you know, blow your back out type situations. Intimidating in the ring, behind the scenes, John Tenta was a very different man. They were gentlemen, respected by everybody. Everybody could count on John Tenta to do the job and do it right. No doubt about that. My dad was a good guy, regardless if he was a heel or not. He cared deeply about his family, and he also cared a lot about other people. It's not very dark side of the wrestling, huh? But a change in fortune for both men... Oh, <laughs> turned these once respected superstars into parodies of themselves. He was oh. so many gimmicks. It was probably hard from the tape. I felt like that was the low of the low for him. Biscuit man can put you on the stars or he can put you in hell. Just that simple. You don't walk out on Vince McMahon. If you do, you're going to pay for it. I don't think John give a damn. The main important thing to make the money and take care of his family. And for John Tenta and his family, a cruel ending that no one saw coming. John doesn't want to go to the doctor. He waited too long. My dad's a fighter. He's going to fight through this. There's no way this will take him down. I just prayed, God, please heal him. Please let us have more time with our dad. Dark side of the ring, John Tanner, like I said, Tenta, like I said, man, we're going to get into it. But before we get into this right now, I need you guys to go subscribe to the channel. I'm going to be doing these every single week. When this drops, I drop. And when I drop, you need to be here. And the only way you're going to be here is if you get that subscribe button pushed. And then you put on all notifications. So when I drop, you know what it is, baby. Because for the next month or two, this is what I'm doing, baby. Let's go subscribe to the channel, baby. man in the audience right now and bring him into the ring and he can get on Dino Bravo's back 
Dino Bravo and the Ultimate Warrior were having a push-up contest in the middle of the ring. And the gimmick was uh, to find the biggest guy in the stands and to calm him down. The whole audience already realized there was this giant man in the audience that would be perfect to be in this competition. Wow. Oh my goodness. Yeah. When my dad made his debut in the WWE, he was planted in the audience. Take a look at the size yeah, of this that's man. Jimmy Hart called him down. John from West Virginia. And uh, he's wearing this bright blue shirt, jeans and white shoes, looking like a, a dad. And so he's sitting on the Ultimate Warrior's back. Then he just smashes him. <laughs> Wait a minute! Whoa! Bravo! We see the first iteration of the Earthquake Splash and establishing himself as a, a pretty major heel. Both of a man down across the chest! Hey, this guy learned how to wrestle pretty quick! Yeah, no kidding! I smell a rat! That's how he's introduced into the wrestling world. My name's Jeff Tenta, and Earthquake's my father. Everybody knew me as Lil Quake. Everybody knew my dad. I was just in the backstage a lot of times when he was wrestling. And I can honestly say that he was definitely respected. My dad told you to keep an eye on my kid. They were going to do it. It was kind of surreal being backstage. I've watched these wrestlers and their own personas and their gimmicks, just kind of doing their thing, just talking to each other. I'm Joanna, and I'm the daughter of Earthquake John Tenta. I did want to be a wrestler. <laughs> I still love wrestling today, and growing up, I thought there was nobody cooler than my dad. My name is John Tenta, the youngest child of John Earthquake and Josephine Tenta. My dad was good at making the audience buy into this villain. I think he was incredible in the ring. When John Tenta debuts in WWF in 1989, he's already had a storied career that has taken him halfway around the world from his hometown of Surrey, British Columbia. My dad knew that he wanted to become a wrestler uh, from a very young age. My grandfather was also a, a huge wrestling fan, and so they only got a few channels, but they would always tune in to watch wrestling. From that moment on, he was hooked. He knew that that was what he wanted to do. My grandmother and grandfather were not wealthy people. They couldn't afford to buy him a weight set or, or get him into extracurricular sports and things like that. So he found other ways to exercise. Going to the parks, lifting park benches, or doing whatever he could to just get stronger. They believed in him from the beginning. He was a Canadian world champion in wrestling, and he was being prospected by 12 major universities in the U.S. And we know that he ended up going to LSU and wrestling there. But when they dropped their wrestling program, he found wrestling in other ways. The oldest Japanese sport is sumo, a form of wrestling which dates back to hand-to-hand -to -hand combat techniques of nearly 20 centuries ago. John Tenta was 22 years old. One of the sumo wrestling stable came to college wrestling meet and recruited him when he was in Louisiana State University. He quit college and came to Japan to live and start as a sumo wrestler. Hello, my name is Fumi Saito. I'm a journalist, I'm an author, I'm a wrestling historian. Sumo is Japanese national sport. They still wear kimonos, they have samurai hairdos, and sumo wrestler is like more like a sumo society. Sumo is different. The way they train, the discipline, you have to fight for it. My name is Haku. I've been with wrestling for 40 years. For wrestling, you climb over the top rope and jump. But sumo is more on the ground and more physical. John was probably the tallest one of that time, and he was big too. I believe they were looking at him to be a grand champion. He went into three consecutive tournaments and won all three tournaments. He was basically undefeated for eight months period until he decided to walk out. I like sumo, I like the sport, but I just can't live the lifestyle. There was a lot of demands and a lot of pressure put on you. I had to do anything that my senior wrestlers asked me. And when I interviewed him the following year, he felt that he always wanted to be a professional wrestler. That was his goal. He was signed with All Japan Pro Wrestling in July of 1986. He basically learned from Japanese side and American side together. 
he enjoyed professional wrestling a lot more than he enjoyed sumo wrestling. That's for sure. He learned the customs and spoke Japanese too. He was treated more like a local now. My love, there's only John in my life. It's only John forever. <laughs> my name is Josephine, and I'm married with John Earthquake Tenta. I'm from the Philippines. Luckily, I got my visa and go to Japan for singing entertainer. He went into the place that I was working, and my mama sang introduced him to me. This love at first sight for him and for me. My mama sang told me he's a wrestler, but I don't know nothing about wrestling. So to me, so what? He's really famous. John was six seven. And how tall are you? Four eleven. It didn't bother me at all. Don't get it twisted, man. My mom may be barely five foot, but she's the alpha in the house. I promise you that. They really are a love story for the ages. Everything had to be in the right place and set in motion at the right time for them to even find each other in such a big world. I know right away that he's a good man and big heart. The following year, WWF at the time was already interested in John Tenta as Hulk Hogan's opponent. And John Tenta asked the company, would it be okay to leave and join WWE? The great Kabuki, I believe, was the one who told him, go ahead and do it. And That's your chance. Before go accepting ahead. the yeah. offer from the WWF, John Tenta makes a commitment, not just to Josephine, but to her son Jeff as well. We were a package deal, me and my mom. And uh, the first time I saw him, he was sitting there in one of our chairs in front of a window and just his whole body would just cover that whole window. That's the lasting image I have the first time I meet my father. Only father I know, so he is my dad. When they got married shortly after, we both flew from Philippines to Canada. Obviously, I was a little, a little nervous, a little scared. Different country, a whole new world. As John and his family settle in British Columbia, his WWF career ignites with an in-ring feud against the world champion, Hulk Hogan. And world Wrestling Federation heavyweight champion, and he has never looked better. There's nothing going on in the wrestling business. Could he be any bigger than the Hulkamania? When you come in there and you're working right off on top, that means you're somebody and you're good. Hey, this is Earl Heaven, and I've been a referee for over 40 years. John was a special friend of mine, always. We were all a team. John knew how to handle the matches. He knew how to make them exciting. He may have been a rookie, but he had credentials. He earned it. Hi, I'm Jake the Snake Roberts, WWE superstar and master of the DDT. DDT! DDT! Stone Mountain, Georgia! John took it like he'd been doing it for years. I couldn't believe when I found out how long he'd been wrestling. I was amazed. Hogan tries to go for the finish, but no. It's a spot that everybody wants. When you're wrestling the champ, you're going to be paid like a champ. I think my dad was a great foe for Hulk Hogan because he was one of the, the only guys that was actually bigger than him. He was really great at generating heat. So you needed somebody that you could really hate. The last time I came face to face with Hulk Hogan, they carried him up on a stretcher. And all the little Hulkamaniacs cried their little eyes out because they knew Hulkamania was dead. Oh, God, forget about it. You wrestle Hogan, you've made it. You're that guy, you're it. His career was going to just take off and keep taking off, and uh, it was exciting. The most important match for John Tenta as a professional wrestler happened back in Japan, 1991. The Tokyo Dome event was Hulk Hogan, Randy Savage, Bret Hart, all these superstars. But it was another attraction for former sumo wrestler John Tenta against former grand champion of sumo wrestling, Koji Kitao, rookie professional wrestler. Kitao was not a popular professional wrestler. He thought he was going to be just as big a star. He wasn't. For Kitao, John Tenta was somebody who tried sumo wrestling for one year and didn't even make it. And this time, actually, John Tenta was 
bigger and better than Kitao. I love that part of the that, story, you know, man. He was uh, Bruce Lee or something. He didn't care about the rules, the respect, and everything. The first match, an earthquake drop. John Tenter pinned Koji Kitao, a former Yokozuna Grand Champion sumo wrestler. Oh, Kitao wasn't happy. I believe second night at Kobe, John was gonna go over too, again. That night, Kitao worked against the booking plan. This is a big, this is a fucking big. We were standing there because we knew already that he was, you know, he might pull something and he did. Kitao went like this, he was gonna poke his eye. Come on, you gotta have a fight, you gotta fight. And I know when he went for that eye poke, my dad delivered a real kick. It's like an MMA match. After Katao disqualified himself from the match to end it and saw it wasn't going anywhere, grabbed a mic, told everyone that wrestling was fake, that it was all a lie, it was all a scam. John Tenta, you are fake, and this is the whole thing is fake, and he walked out on the match. We were all there in the dressing room, and John bust in there and said, where's that son of a bitch? I'm going to kick his ass. It was Kitao who got booed out of the building. That was the last time Kitao worked for SWS company. He was fired the next day. Of course, as he should. John is very kind. John is very quiet. Those are the guys that you have to watch out for. Yo, you know what's crazy right now is that none of you motherfuckers is subscribed. I got thousands and thousands and tens of thousands of views, but I only got 360 fucking, view, fucking subscribers. So what I need you to do, if you want to see the rest of these motherfuckers in Dark Side of the Ring, I'm going to need you to subscribe to the channel of the High Flying Podcast with me, Biggie Fucking Bag Johnny. You know what it is. You want to see wrestling content? Holla at your boy. I got you. Just holla. Holla, I got you. After former sumo grand champion turned wrestler Koji Katao goes rogue during a match in Japan, he's fired for his actions. But for John Tenta, the incident cements his reputation as a true professional. When John Tenta went back to the States, entire backstage of WWE asked him, I heard you had shoot match in Japan and you took care of yourself. Great. Everybody had so much respect for John Tenter Earthquake from that day forward. Oh, look at this! Earthquake doing this thing! He loved that gimmick. It made him feel big. It made him feel like he was a force to be reckoned with. And my dad would always brag about, look, I'm the most hated bad guy. You know, because he knew he did his job. Roberts, last week you thought you were real smart yeah. trying to put that snake on me. I'm telling you here and now, keep Damien away from me. I can't stand snakes, but most of all, I can't stand you. I hate your guts. Damien was my pet snake that I, I loved and trusted, and, and I always had the snake with me, you know, and then at the end of the match, I'd get the snake out and drape it across the fallen opponents. It was my gimmick. Check the snake Roberts with Damien in the bag. The idea was for him to kill it. They wanted me to get knocked out of the ring and then tend to do the damage to the snake where he jumps on the snake while I'm down and out. So I would never see it. I told him, hell no, that's not the way to do that. The way to do that is to tie me in the ropes and make me watch it. Jake always puts Damien underneath the ring. And at the time, there was another bag underneath the ring. So he'd grab the bag, put it on the center of the ring. He's got Damien in the ring, but from behind again. Quick ran into the ropes and give him this big boom squash. Watch this, folks. Please don't watch it. Oh, he's going to go. He's going to go. He's going to the amazing Oscar performance of Jake, you know, crying and bawling his eyes out while he watched my dad. This is where we cut it off on part one, but now we're giving you the whole scoop, so go subscribe, goddammit! I went to the bag and opened up the bag and seen Damien all crushed, which wasn't Damien, it was a pair of women's pantyhose full of hamburger meat. Tragedy here has befallen Jake the Snake Roberts. We got some letters over it, you know, because it traumatized so many kids. 
You know, it's wrestling, for God's sake. Come on. And not only that, the, the aftermath after squashing Damien, there's a segment where he serves Vince McMahon and Bobby the Brain some burgers that he'd cooked up, and he called them Quake Burgers, and that the meat rhymed with Quake. You think this is funny? I gotta eat. Boy. After my dad feuded with Hulk Hogan and with Jake the Snake, you know, the storylines were maybe running a little bit thin. My dad approached Typhoon, or Tugboat, Fred, at the time, to essentially join up. Hi, this is Fred Ottman, Tugboat, Typhoon, the Shockmaster, the B-A-double-D, Big Steel Man, and also one half of the Natural Disasters. What you got? And I was superstar Big Bubba, too. I have a memorable dance contest with Rocky Johnson, and I got the opportunity to bust a giant boombox over his noggin. You can tell he enjoyed that motherfucking boombox knocking over his noggin, because he said that too fucking smooth. Good night. Fred, you know, he, he didn't know his own strength. He was laying there in a puddle of blood. I go, you killed him. That was Fred, or Big Bubba, wrapped up into a ball. I'm Jerry Sags, one half the infamous tag team, the Nasty Boys. That's the time we first met Big Bubba, Fred. He'd become many other gimmicks after that. The old tugboat is just like the Battleship Missouri, brother. He's loaded. He's ready for battle, brother. <laughs> Full steam ahead. Tugger's coming to town. No. office call from WWF and they go we'd like to put you in Earthquake together Jimmy Hart will be your manager you will be Typhoon and he will be Earthquake the natural disasters I thought it was a great deal for Fred the transition because those two guys together were monsters 852 pounds combined weight gotta be a record we wrestled John and Fred a lot but you had to change your whole game plan out because you weren't throwing these guys in the rope and power bombing them or you go to give them a double tackle, but me and Oz are both get knocked on our ass. You know, you let Fred do his strongman stuff and Quake could work with anybody. They were just another notch, one of the greatest teams we wrestled. You got the earthquake and you got typhoon. That kind of weather you shouldn't be wrestling. Chasing the dream, the champ deal is awesome. And having it is awesome. But you may be in uh, Connecticut today or Madison Square Garden and then have to fly out to L.A. The schedule of the WWE was really brutal. Seven days a week, twice on Saturday, twice on Sunday. You're like an absentee father, sort of. Your wife is a stronghold of the household and she's taking care of the family while you're gone. He'd be gone uh, a month at a time, and he'd be home for a couple days. Clearly, it was tough on my mom. New environment, new country. She expected him to be home a little bit more. John was having a hard time, too, because I'm, I'm new to the place, so he's, he's worried about me. Especially when uh, I, I have Jeffrey and Juwan at that time. I didn't know who he was because I saw him very seldomly. It was this massive giant walking through the door and the, the person who's been with me the most is this petite tiny Filipino woman and I'm sure that broke his heart which makes me sad to think about the pressure there to come home is monstrous side man how much is too much the answer is it was all too much but that didn't matter to Mr. man And there he is. There's my buddy, the Quiddy. And I can't leave him by himself, you know what I'm saying? So the disasters have to be together, spend some time. And we're equal opportunity smashers, okay? Because there's money money incorporated. incorporated. Having a bad day. In 1992, the natural disasters dominate the WWF tag team scene, setting themselves apart backstage with their unique approach to life on the road. There were guys that their goal was about a strip club or women. Where's the party? John was neither of those. 
And Fred was neither of those. I wasn't ever really a big drinker. I didn't do drugs and that stuff. You know, I'd be with John. We'd go in the room and bullshit and talk about home life and stupid shit that we'd seen on the road. (laughs) Sometimes it's better just to sit back and see it unfurl. (laughs) They were straight up guys. You know what I mean? Uh, But the two son of a bitches could put some food away. You know what I mean? (laughs) You know? The plate couldn't hold enough. I'm like, Fred, you go back for more. It looked like uh, Mount St. Helens or something. You know, but he would go back for four more plates. He's one of the greatest guys I've met in this business. He's very humble, uh, always ready to give 100%. Plus, it wasn't bad having a guy his size covering my back either. They really became close friends, that natural disaster run. And it was a good run. At the beginning of 1993, the reign of the natural disasters comes to an end as John Tenta returns to Japan. That's probably been the problem with my career is that I'm, I'm impatient and uh, I just didn't see a whole lot going on. Uh, they had different tag teams they wanted to push and we kind of got pushed to, to the back and I just felt we were too big to be pushed to the back. So right. I kind of took a hiatus and went back to Japan for a while. Fred Ottman continues to wrestle for the WWF until later that year when an unthinkable tragedy brings Fred home to Florida. I was opening two bars in Key West. My brother-in-law, Randy, was supposed to run the business when I was on the road, and my brother-in-law was out on the phone by that building, and there was some young kids that were there, and they start messing with a good friend of his. And Randy drops the phone and goes over to try to de-escalate the situation. Well, the oldest guy had a pistol and shot the gun, and he hit my brother-in-law, and he dropped dead on the spot. I'm sorry, Tucker, but uh, I think Randy was in some shit. He, you know what I mean? It was the 80s, so the motherfucker was probably on that shit, bro. He was, he was probably dealing some shit out of your club, man. You know what I mean? You, you, nigga don't and so, shot, with everything I had going on, there was no one to take over the business. It took I mean, me off the road, and, and uh, not what I had planned, but, you know, my family... While Fred struggles to help his family, John's work schedule in Japan takes him further away from his own. My dad at the time, the travel was starting to wear on him. My mom and dad got into a pretty big fight just because he wasn't home enough. It was a pretty big blowout, you know. My my mom was just tired of not, you know, seeing him as often as she would have liked to. I remember that day like it was yesterday, man. In August of 1993, Fred Ottman makes his return to the ring for the WWF's rival, WCW, but soon finds himself at the center of one of the most embarrassing moments in wrestling history while the cameras are live. The Shock Master was the gimmick. This was live TV. Tonight's special guests are Sting, the British Bulldog, Davy Boy Smith, and their mystery guest. It was Sting and Davy Boy. They're tagged up, and it was the Harlem Heat on the other side. And Fred was supposed to attack Harlem Heat or something. Hey, they're going to tell us before you get carried away who their special tag team partner is, brother. You better go cool down. The whole idea was that I was the mystery partner. Let me bust through the wall with this gimmick on. The true Shockmaster was almost like a comic book. Like a Darth Vader head or something, right? Here, try this on. This is what you're going to wear when you go through here. It's got two little pinholes. Like little little pinholes. Like this. At most. And then glitter is coming in. They built a wall that was two by four studs. You know, 12, 14 inch on center. 5, 8 sheetrock. Like a wall in your house. Now, they didn't gimmick the wall, though. They didn't score it or anything like that to make it easier. The guy gave me the cue. He says, Fred, you're going to have to hit that wall hard, man. Do you remember the Shockmaster? Shockmaster. I can show it to you. Do you want to see what I'm talking about? Our partner is going to shock the world because he is none other than the Shockmaster! Oh. <laughs> what the f***? I go... What in the hell was that? Was that Fred? The Shock Master! Right. The Shock Master! <laughs> I told you. Oh, oh. 
Oh, God. Look oh, at this one. Oh, man, this bastard. He fell out. <laughs> it looked like he hit that thing and come down. <laughs> what happened was I hit it so hard. Like this one when I went through the wall. It put me straight over like a teeter-totter at, at a kid's playground. <laughs> he, 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 was, he was looking for the, for the gimmick. <laughs> Call me the Shockmaster. What a lot of people don't know is that wasn't Fred's voice talking. It was only... Anderson, with his growly voice, was on a microphone. Come after me, Sid. I'm ready. Is this the end of it? <laughs> we might as well. We can't top this one here. <laughs> Fred, I still love you. <laughs> I never seen that shit before. <laughs> <laughs> he was going to crush people or shock them, whatever he was going to do, but he fell. And that was <laughs> that was the end of that. The shock master. It was horrendous. But you know what? You can turn a negative into a positive. It's been very, very good to me. That's the uh, classic shock master. It made an internet sensation out of Fred falling through the wall. So if there'd be like a plane crash and Fred ran in and saved like all the school kids out of the plane and before it blew up he'd still be remembered as shock master right there. <laughs> <You know? laughs> it's funny as shit oh my goodness <laughs> remember guys we're almost done with this right now but you gotta go subscribe to my channel you wanna watch this man I'm gonna stop doing this shit I'm the only one that's not getting took down. You see all these other people, they getting took down. My shit's not getting took down. So keep fucking around if y'all motherfuckers want to. I'm about to stop doing these shits for you. victorious, and by the way... A former star for Vince McMahon's WWF, John Tenta has grown disillusioned with the company and the toll its aggressive schedule took on his family. Then I uh, wasn't so pleased at the time with the financial situation, so I called WCW. I think that he was ready to find a solution that would allow him to be with his family more. And I think at that time, WCW kind of threw him the life raft. They gave him such big contracts and less working days on the road. We moved from Canada to Florida so that my dad could have more time at home. It was so easy to, to be around him, to be around family, and just to enjoy each other, whether it was something like going to Disney or it was a Thursday night and I popped in a laser disc so we could sing karaoke. He is a karaoke king, man. Uh, House of the Rising Sun uh, was one of his favorite songs they sing. We sing together and we like the, the duet of Endless Love. When my dad was home, he showed up to any event, any show, any game, anything that we had going on. That was a nice bass hit there. He was all about making memories and, and doing things with the family. That's awesome. Thank you, sweetie. But as John's family life is solidified, his career in the ring is coming apart. Introducing first, Avalanche! The WCW couldn't use the Earthquake name. So he came in as Avalanche. Vince McMahon owned the name Earthquake. To go out there and change your name and everything it confuses the fans. The Avalanche was too close to Earthquake. And so that'd be kind of infringing on that trademark. So unfortunately, that gimmick didn't last very long. After Avalanche, we all got graced with Shark, uh, which he absolutely hated. Did they put a, a fin on him? I thought to myself, that's, that's stupid. He did it just uh, because, you know, it's supporting the family. Once again, it's a job. You know, he's going to do what he needs to do to make it work and be all in on it. You know, at that time, I was uh, still about 430 pounds. There was a few people southern east, Wales, stuff like that. I just think maybe they just never could get the right character that they wanted out of him. 
After a year of portraying the shark in WCW, John finally gets the opportunity to define himself in the ring. I'm not the shark. I'm not a fish. I'm not an avalanche. I'm a man. John Tanta. But very much so felt like it was his mic drop moment with all of all of these gimmicks. But the bottom line is he was never given the storylines that he had in the WWE. He was never put in the position to make money in, in WCW. He was just used. But in 1998, during what is supposed to be his triumphant return to the WWF, John Tenta is forced into his oddest gimmick yet. The Golga character was a member of the oddities, uh, where you had Luna Bashan, um, Kurgan, and Giant Silva. So he had this huge Cartman doll that he brought out to the ring with him. He was under a mask. Putting John under a mask was just humiliation. You know, they didn't want him to, to get the kudos that he would have had if they just went him, ran him out there as Earthquake. They wanted to do something that was just grotesque. Even when he was in the shark or the avalanche, he was an earthquake. Even when he was Golga, he was an earthquake. Everybody wanted earthquake back. And all these other gimmicks were just trying to get back to, you know, his glory days. When Golga ran its course, you couldn't go back to, to the WCW. Uh, where else did you go? Which is likely why that sparked his wrestling school that he opened up in, in Sanford. It didn't work out. It's like always money coming out, but nothing's really coming in. We had a bankruptcy. Everything changed. He has the school for maybe I will say a year or under a year. And then uh, he, he started doing the, the retail. He got a job at, at the mall. Uh, he worked in the big and tall section. Uh, you know, he'd have fans recognize him. Dude is working in the men's department, you know, sweating his ass off. It is incredibly hard to go from being a superstar to working retail somewhere. John was going to make a living for his family, regardless of what he was. If he had to shovel shit, he'd do it to provide for his family. After my dad left retail, he started truck driving. He, he saw it as an opportunity to make a little bit more money. You know, it's, it wasn't a glamorous job. He would be, you know, peeing in, in, in gallon jugs because he just don't have time to stop at a truck stop. And he started to notice that there were blood clots in his urine and he was on the road. And so he wasn't able to get to a doctor very quickly. And he kind of kept it a secret from my mom for a little while. He kind of got away with letting this, this thing, this, this tumor in his bladder grow for longer than it should have. When he went to the doctor, they gave him a very short prognosis and said that there wasn't anything that they were going to be able to do. He said it was already advanced too far. It's already too late because the size of the tumor is like a baseball size. After being diagnosed with advanced bladder cancer, John Tanta and his wife must break the news to their children. My parents um, sat me and my siblings down and they said that my dad had cancer um, and that they were going to Houston for a second opinion. There were a lot of tears and um, a lot of worry and fear. Well, my sister works in, in, in healthcare and she told me that bladder cancer is one of the most curable cancers. And so for that to, to take him down because he was away from home or you know, he kept it a secret, uh, it's, really, it's, a, it's a bummer to hear. It definitely sucked. He felt like if he was still wrestling, he, they might have caught it earlier. So he might have had a fighting chance. Uh, I walked in on him sitting at the edge of the bed watching some old tapes. There were VHS tapes all over the floor and I heard him laughing and he was watching the segment on primetime. He was quoting himself in the segment. He was loving it. He was making himself laugh with the jokes that he was telling. I do think that my dad was kind of forged to be tough, you know, and it's funny, you know, you think like, oh, you just got to fight as hard as you can, but it's so much more than that, right? It's not like he could do a body slam to the tumors in his bodies. As one of the wrestling world's most imposing figures takes on the battle of his life, few in the business even know of his struggle. John, I wish 
that he told me that he needed help, especially it wasn't just about you, but it was also for your family. But too late to find out that you kept it to yourself. In the summer of 2005, um, gosh, my dad looked actually great that summer. He he looked a lot like himself. He was going through chemo and all that stuff, and uh, you know they still had uh, high hopes that they were going to beat it. And um, I was getting married that June 2005. Before the wedding, he called me on the phone. He says, "Fred, is he says the the cancer is back," you know. So we're trying to uh, to see if, they, if it can be fixed, you know. So we didn't tell the kids. At the wedding, um, my brother and his wife had the karaoke machine set up, and one of my mom's songs to my dad is You Needed Me. And so she was starting to sing that song, and um, kind of halfway through, she just started breaking down and, and crying. My dad came to my mom, and uh, they had that crying session, uh, just hugging each other and, and, and crying. Love him so much. When you love someone, nothing is hard as long as you, you're with that person that you love. At that point, they pretty much figured it was, you know, game over for my dad. Just before his eldest son, Jeff's wedding, John Tenta learns that the cancer has spread throughout his body. You know, looking back, it's not shocking that he wasn't quick to tell us. Maybe maybe he knew it was bad from the beginning and, you know, was just trying to stretch out as much time as he could. And I told him that, don't you worry. Kids and I are gonna be okay. So if it's time, he can go. But before he closed his eyes, one by one they they talked to him. I couldn't stop thanking him for the life that he's been able to give us, you know, give me. He didn't need to take me along, but he did anyways. And I greatly appreciated everything that he's done, made me a better person, better man, you know. I told him how much I loved him. I told him thank you for being um, such a great dad. And I remember just throwing myself on top of him one more time and giving him one more hug. My dad loved to laugh, and so anytime he would tell a joke, or he would tease my mom, or he saw me from across the room, he'd flash a wink at me. And so, I remember when it was it was my turn to go in. I went to go and talk to him. I don't remember what I said, but he winked at me. In his final moments, he was looking at each of us in the room and locking eyes with us. And um, my dad died while I was holding his hand. He passed away on June 7th, 2006, which was just, gosh, a couple weeks from his 43rd birthday and uh, a couple months before his first grandkid. So. You can never... Um forget about it, you know. It's still hard. It was Fred who called me about John. But those calls for our era of guys happened too many times. Too many times. It was just horrible to hear it because he was such a sweet man. John Tenta was laid to rest in Houston, Texas, surrounded by the love of his family 
but without any representation from the business he devoted himself to for over 20 years. There's no wrestlers, no flowers from the boss. The amount of work that my dad had put out there for the amount of punishment he put you know, his body through for entertainment and for his bosses. And I just wish that they would have, you know, tried a little harder to reach out to him and to show more love because he was a gentle giant and he would have done anything for anybody. John and Jimmy Hart and my brother who just passed away last July. We were a family on the road. This was my family. Talking about it now is, is, is heartbreaking for me when you lose a good friend like that. There's nothing I've heard bad about this. Because people. this is my sumo brother here. And that's how I am going to remember John forever. Brother. He should be remembered as a wrestler who lived the fullest. You know, he came to Japan and he had very healthy, good run as a professional wrestler. I stopped watching wrestling for years, and recently I've now been more interested in watching my dad's matches. I feel a sense of pride. I can watch them and I can be amazed that my dad did that. He is a true legend, not just for his talent. Him as a person, he was the entire package. I love you, brother. I love you. What is that picture of mom and dad right there? Johnny's my love of my life. My uh, soulmate. Well, this is the first picture of him and me. And he wrote something in the back, too. So this was in 1986. December 1986? Yeah. Yeah. What does it say on the back? Would you like to? <laughs> <laughs> this is our first picture taken together. I was so happy being with you. It made me feel so good. I can hardly wait until we are together all the time. Always remember, I love you, John. If you look up to the heaven, you're going to see him smiling to see how the kids turned out. He's proof that you can be nice and work really hard and leave an impact. My dad was many things to many different people, um, but to us, he was just a, a great dad. Yeah. That story is sad, man. I'm not going to lie. The first time I watched that, I cried. I wish I could have actually shared that with you guys, but <clears throat> me watching the damn thing so many times, you know what I mean? I know this fucking thing line for line. That's why I wasn't really pausing or anything, but Remember, guys, go subscribe to the channel, the High Flying Podcast, and go subscribe to the uh, Heated Shenanigans, Cash Me, and Scott Hewlett every week, twice a week, at the Heated Shenanigans, brother. And yeah, man, just, just show love to the channel. I see all you guys tuning in every week, every time I drop these things, but you guys are not subscribing, so hit the subscribe button, all notifications, so you know when I drop, because for the next month or two, this is what I'm doing. And I do it for you guys, man, because I love the, this uh, dark side, and I know you guys love it. So, uh, fuck with me, man. Fuck with me. All right, man. Hot Flying Podcast. It's your boy, Biggie Bad Johnny. Let's go. The Big Bad Network presents the Hot Flying Podcast, where we dive off the top higher than RVD and Matt Riddle's love child with your host, Biggie Bad Johnny. Subscribe to the channel. And stay up to date on all things wrestling related. So grab your belts and bongs, bad bitches with thongs, and watch whatever episode that you want to put on. It's the High Flying Podcast with Biggie Bag John. Let's go. This is the Deathmatch King, Matt Cardona. You're listening to the High Flying Podcast with Big Bad Johnny. They said they were going to pay me. Where's my fucking money? What's up, guys? We're Steve Brian Cage. We need to have the High Flying Podcast. This is Big Bad Johnny. Tap on the Don. I got it right this time. So everybody who missed the first couple blocks, you could be just there. All right, check it out. High Flying Podcast. Who better?
Thank you for all the doors that you opened up, so you got to bust through the windows, man. And, and, uh, I always have to appreciate it. When, uh, in 2004, Eddie Guerrero came up to me and thanked me for opening up the door for the Hispanics at the WWF. That meant a lot to me, yeah. man, when he, when he told me that. So I, I